Hi folks, welcome to the week on trauma and dissociation and some other subjects as well. So what I want to do in this first lecture is kind of steel man the position of trauma and dissociation theorists. In other words, steel manning is putting forward a strong argument so that you can hear their argument from their eyes. You already know that I don't really subscribe to some of the theory of trauma and dissociation, but any criticism I'll try and keep for a follow-up lecture. So first I'm going to remind you of the past researchers who came up with um, trauma and dissociation, just to get you up to date very quickly. I've talked about that before in week one. Uh, but what I didn't do in week one is go into more detail. I've looked at all the past um, lectures that I've done and I have not gone into detail on this theory. So I'm going to elaborate the theory, show you where it comes from. You know, it's not just as simple as you may, may first appear. You know, the, uh, at first it appears that the main theory is that trauma causes dissociation and that's it. But actually it comes from a, a wider theory that is trauma causes psychopathology. And of course, there may be some uh, truth to, to that. There, there usually is truth to uh, um, parts of these theories, even, even though I disagree with them. So I'm going to steel man the position of trauma dissociation by explaining the theory using a diagram at first. Then I'm going to pull some strong quotes out of books that actually believe in the theory, um, such as the DSM-5 from other books, um, from the ICD-10, and then from authors in peer-reviewed journals more recently, such as Constance Stallenberg and Bethany Brand's articles. And also I'm going to look at the evidence that they think is supporting the idea that one of the major mechanisms in psychopathology is trauma causing dissociation. And I'm going to present it in this first lecture uh, in a positive light, in, as if it were true, to give a strong steel manning of their position. So let me say a few words about why this topic of trauma and dissociation is important. Why are we expanding it into a week in of itself? Well, it's because it's the most up-to-date manifestation of Freud's repressed memory theory. It's been adapted and changed, of course, a lot, but it's, a ver it's the theory that you're most likely to come across as a forensic psychologist or just as a regular person, you know, looking for uh, therapy, you know, um, or looking for therapy for somebody who you care for. Um, so you will come across this. I'm sure you come across it a lot already. You've noticed it, um, you know, the talk about trauma, dissociation, dissociative amnesia, and dissociative identity disorder. But now that I've mentioned it to you, I bet you start to see it even more um, once you start looking out for it. So this way of framing things, of course, is in the DSM-5. We'll talk about that. That's why it's important. It's in other important books. It's kind of embedded into our culture. So that's why we're talking about trauma dissociation this week. And we're not talking about old uh, terminology, just what they use nowadays. I think this is needed for you to navigate as a forensic psychologist. Um, if you understand exactly where they're coming from, even even if you don't believe in a theory. To be able to affect change in society, you need to understand the theories that you don't necessarily agree with. Okay, so let's move on. And just to reiterate how important and current this is, as you can see on the 10th of July, 2021, there will be a talk, a live webinar given by Dr. Valerie Sinison the same psychotherapist that Kevin Felstead told you had treated his sister, Carol Felstead. Um, so it's going to be given and it's going to be called The Truth About Trauma and Dissociation. So it says here that Valerie Sinison is a world leader in the study of traumatology. So that's a term you might come across in this area and has pioneered some of, of the most difficult work in the field. In the first part of the presentation, she focuses on the clinical implications of extreme adverse childhood experiences, uh, disorganized attachment, and 
result in dissociative identity disorders. All right, so this is why it is current and also why this topic is still relevant and current today. Here is a book that came out in October 2020 by Valerie Sinison called The Truth About Dissociation, Everything You Didn't Want to Know and Were Afraid to Ask. And unfortunately, we can't look inside without buying it. There's no button to press there. But as you can see, that has got very high ratings and is sold in another, a number of different areas. So that establishes importance and the fact that it's current. Okay, let's just give you a brief reminder of the past developments in trauma and dissociation theory, some of which you know, some of, some of which I haven't mentioned before. So I've told you about mesmers, um, mesmerism, and how that transformed into hypnosis into the 1800s. And then in the 1880s, Pierre Janet and the other hypnotists came up with ideas about trauma and dissociation, the idea that trauma causes dissociation, the kind of splitting away from yourself. Of course, Freud developed the idea of repressed memories, which you could equate to dissociative amnesia. Um, so, equate, um, you know, connecting trauma and dissociation theory to the idea of blocked memories. Um, that was one of his contributions. And Morton Prince in 1910, I think it was, published a book on a case study of multiple personalities that talked about trauma and dissociation and the extension to split identities or more than one identity. So those were important milestones. And there's been a lot of researchers uh, since then who've developed trauma and dissociation theory. Since then, the DSM has progressed from the DSM-1, just to give you a kind of a, a, an idea of how this has been developing over the years. So the general theory of trauma and dissociation was kind of embedded into the psychoneurotic reactions heading in the DSM-1. And the subheading underneath that that was relevant was called dissociative reaction in 1952. In 1968, the DSM-2 had the subheading hysterical neurosis. And you can see that these early headings are very much influenced by the terminology that early psychoanalysis like Freud used, such as hysterical neurosis, so that terminology was still around in 1968 and the subheading under hysterical neurosis that's relevant to a dissociative disorder was dissociative type. The DSM 3, 4 and 5 created the general heading of dissociative disorders where there was lots of subheadings and some of those subheadings changed but the main heading did not change. Now the subheadings changed from the DSM 3 for example, uh, dissociative amnesia in the DSM-3 was called psychogenic amnesia, and then it was changed to dissociative amnesia in the DSM-4 in 1994 and the DSM-5 in 2013. Um, dissociative identity disorder was first introduced in the 1994 version, the DSM-4, and that subheading is the same in DSM-5. In 1980, the, the DSM-3 had a different subheading called multiple personalities, but that has since, since been changed. Um, it was called multiple personality disorder. So the same general theory of trauma dissociation has not really changed, but you can see how the terminology has changed. Now, this is where the general theory of trauma and dissociation starts. Actually, it starts with a gen more general theory, which does not talk about dissociation just yet. The general theory, of course, coming from Freud, Pierre Janet, and so on, is that trauma is a cause, or maybe perhaps the biggest cause, of psychopathology. Now, this used to be called neurosis. It used to be that trauma causes neurosis, but now we call that psychopathology. And what do I mean by that? I mean, um, a very many different types of mental disorders. So psychopathology just means things like uh, depression, uh, dissociative identity disorder, all the categories are um, psychopathologies. So that is the general theory. And the theory says that, you know, it doesn't just cause one category of psychopathology, but uh, more than one. Uh, 
And then the question is, what mechanism helps this relationship? So, or what is the real cause of this relationship? So if we move past the most basic theory and move on to the full trauma and dissociation theory, we can see that the theory goes like this. Trauma causes dissociation and in turn, dissociation causes psychopathology. So if you get too much dissociation, you can just feel general dissociative symptoms. That's one type of psychopathology. The theory goes that if you have an enormous amount of trauma, that would lead to more dissociation and more dissociation might lead to dissociative amnesia symptoms. And then that would be the psychopathology. If you expand that theory and take the instance of very, very severe repeated trauma, then the theory would say that dissociation could be so high at that point that the person may split their personalities and the psychopathology in that case would be dissociative identity disorder. All right, so this is the basic model to understand what people are talking about when you hear trauma and dissociation theory. As you can see, it's not directly linked to memory. So you might hear a lot of, you know, in a given case, a lot of talk about trauma and psychopathology and not know why the memory evidence is relevant. The, well, the reason it's relevant is because the central part of the theory is dissociation. And dissociation, if too much the theory goes, leads to a blocking out of memory. So you're going to have individuals in a given legal case that believe that it is possible to block memories out. So they think that any recovered memories are going to be reliable. Or they may have the theory that trauma causes gaps in memory or a memory that is not complete, in which case they may interpret that as dissociation and that it might be evidence for trauma and evidence for psychopathology. It could go both ways as opposed to an individual just accepting that everybody has gaps in memory. You can see if they used a different theory, they would come to a different conclusion. If they believe that everybody has gaps in memory, then they're going to not conclude that they must have trauma and they may not interpret that those gaps in memory as being psychopathology. Now, the other aspect of dissociation is not just memory, but it is sense of being or a sense of self, really. They call it depersonalization when this goes wrong, or they call it derealization when this goes wrong. So the theory here, and let's steel man the theory, is that trauma causes dissociation so that sometimes people feel that they're not really there or they're leaving their bodies or their self is not inside their head, that kind of feeling of not being as present as you usually are. And of course, there may be alternative explanations for that, you know, so it may be that all people sometimes see past the illusion of self. And, you know, in meditation, you might get this where there's times maybe everybody, regardless of whether they're traumatized or not, do have times where their sense of self is, the illusion of self, um, is kind of suspended for a few seconds, um, you know, maybe through taking a psychoactive drug or meditation or just being tired. So again, you can see that if you believe that the funny feeling of set sense of self being eroded for a time, if you kind of believe in the trauma and dissociation theory, then it'll take you down one path. In other words, you, know, you conclude that because I lost my sense of self for a few seconds, it could be evidence of trauma. And I'll interpret those symptoms as psychopathology. And of course, somebody who does meditation, who doesn't believe in trauma and dissociation, are going to feel a change in the sense of self and not assume they have trauma and not assume they have psychopathology. All right, so as you can see, the theory that individuals hold is very important for diagnosis. And of course, it's very important. The theory that the therapist holds is very important for diagnosis too, because gaps in memory could be interpreted by the psycho psychologist as evidence of trauma or evidence of psychopathology. 
unless they don't believe in this theory and they just believe that everybody has gaps in memory. Same thing goes for losing your sense of self or feeling depersonalized. If the therapist believes in trauma dissociation theory, the chances go up that they're going to interpret that as psychopathology. If the therapist just happens to be into meditation, they're less likely to interpret temporary feelings of depersonalization or loss of self as psychopathology. So I hope that really clarifies the basic theory and uh, because it can get really complicated. Sometimes theorists are not upfront about what the basic theory is, but knowing this, I hope helps. Now, just to illustrate some of the authors who talk about trauma and dissociation theory, some of the most important names, and to pick out some of their quotes to demonstrate what the theory is, how it's phrased and so on. So let's take this first quote here from Putnam, Carlson, uh, Ross, Addison, Clark, and so on, Chu here, uh, Dill, Lowenstein, and Braun. Some of these names are still important today, such as Putnam and Carlson, who came up with the dissociative experiences scale. Ross, Colin Ross is very important player in promoting this theory of trauma dissociation. Chu is also somebody who's still active. If I, if I think that's the same Chu that I'm thinking of. Lowenstein's very important, um, still, to, still writing about it very recently. And Braun is also a big figure. Um, Braun, if you remember, was the psychologist who treated one of those multiple personality cases that resulted in a court case um, in, in, in week one. I talked about that one. And if you go online, you can find more out about these authors. But what they wrote in this paper is a very much a collaborative joint paper. They wrote that numerous clinical studies have established that elevated levels of dissociation are significantly associated with histories of antecedent trauma. All right, so that is just establishing the idea that trauma is at least correlated with dissociation. Now, whether that is true or not, we would have to look at the evidence. Van der Kolk and colleagues, um, Bessel van der Kolk is quite famous for promoting this idea of uh, body memories and, of course, talking about this theory of trauma and dissociation as well, which is actually linked. So van der Kolk um, and the other authors here, including Judith Herman at the end, who is very important in her writing of her books on repressed memories and recall of uh, childhood abuse. I've, I've mentioned um, Judith Herman before, I think maybe in the first week. So what they wrote, also in 1996, and I'll get on to some more recent articles on the next page, but just to, just to kind of demonstrate to you that this kind of terminology was always already starting to get established in the 1990s, you know, so there was a shift away from the old terminology to new terminology of trauma and dissociation in the 1980s when uh, Putnam and Carlson put together their dissociative experiences scale and the 1990s where there was a debate about repressed memories, of course, and you know, the term repressed memories was undermined to a certain extent. So you saw more emergence of terminology of trauma and dissociation since uh, the mid 1990s. So in their paper, van der Kolk and colleagues concluded that numerous studies have demonstrated a strong relation between trauma and dissociative symptoms. Uh, two studies examining the psychological profiles of patients with high scores on the dissociative experiences scale, that's a scale that they use to measure dissociative symptoms, found that the scale scores were highly correlated with reported childhood histories of trauma. And then the, the studies that they're talking about are by Chu and Dill and Sachs et al. Some of the same authors overlapping in these uh, studies. So this is their position. There's a lot of papers that say this kind of thing. So it seems that there's a lot of support from it from a sheer volume point of view. Now let's fast forward to the present day, basically. Here is a 2012 paper that 
summarizes the current view, which is very similar then as it is to today. And some of these players you can see on screen are still big players today. And you can see that Eve Carlson, Carlson is in this paper like she was in the paper we just looked at. Constant Dallerberg and Bethany Brand are names that are probably a good start when you're searching for um, trauma and dissociation model enthusiasts. They are very uh, prolific. They lead a lot of the studies. And then you have uh, David Gleaves in Australia. You have Martin Doherty, Richard Lowenstein again, Ita Cardina, uh, Paul Fruin, Carlson, and David Spiegel. All of these are important names that you see crop up again and again. So you know that they're probably going to be in the realm of trauma dissociation theory when you see these names. They're going to have a idea that uh, dissociative amnesia should be in the DSM. Some of them actually were on the panel that put the DSM, uh, dissociative amnesia into the DSM or ma maintained it in the DSM-5. David Spiegel is quite famous for um, trauma dissociation theory. His father um, was one of the doctors who saw the multiple personality case, Eve. Um, that became um, the Two Faces of Eve book or something like that. I'm just talking off the top of my head here. I, I hope I get, I hope I have the right film. But anyway, David Spiegel's father was actually skeptical of that multiple ca uh, personality case, although both of them believe that multiple personality cases can occur sometimes. They just think it's more rare. So here is a quote from this group of writers, and this was published in the Psychological Bulletin. This is why I'm giving it to you. That's a major top journal, and this was very influential. A couple of, a couple of years later, the false memory researchers responded to it with another long article. But this is what they say about the trauma model. So we're basically talking about trauma and dissociation theory here, it's sometimes called the trauma model. So the quote here, the trauma model posits that the dissociative individual is largely attempting to avoid recall of trauma by conscious and unconscious disavowal of the importance implications and or accuracy of or the reali reality of the memory. So notice that the dissociation of memory, which you might call dissociative amnesia, can be conscious or unconscious. We have talked previously of unconscious uh, repressed memories, but they say sometimes it can be conscious decision not to think about it as well. And then they go on to say, according to the trauma model, the dissociative individual attempts to avoid thinking about the memory, disconnects from the emotional content of the memory, and ultimately may fail to recall some or all of the memory. And they quote other important researchers in this area, um, De Prince and Fried, the 2004 paper, and uh, Dorahy. Now they go on to say the avoidance associated with dissociation may be both conscious and unconscious, or may be an initially conscious process that becomes unconscious over time. And they re reference Erdely here. So Erdely is somebody else who has written favorably on the idea of Freudian repression. Now, they're, they're talking about two things here. They're talking about suppression, which is conscious, and they're also including the possibility of unconscious blocking of memories, which they might call, you might call repression, although they don't use that terminology. As you can see here, they don't use that much anymore. So that gives you an idea of the current thinking of trauma and dissociation advocates. These authors tend to be the more reasonable branch of the trauma and dissociation theory movement. You have other writers and uh, researchers who are less careful than, let's say, David Spiegel is, and David Spiegel's at um, Stanford University. So um, there's some reasonableness to, to this group of individuals. They don't agree with the false memory researchers. Um, take on unconscious dissociation, but as you can see, they are not advocating for some of the more crazier ideas. Now, here is the diagram of the model that they talk about in that same article. 
by uh, Dallenberg at all. So let's go through this a little bit. So the way they have it written out as the trauma model is that they have trauma on the left with arrows pointing to mediators and moderators and then to dissociation. What I take this to mean is that the overall model really here is that trauma causes dissociation and that is mediated or moderated by some variables. I think that is the best way to explain what they're thinking here. So trauma on the left can include uh, sexual, physical, um, unexpected negative events and frightening parental behavior or parental abandonment. Then let's go to the output here, which is a dissociation, which they think is caused by trauma here, basically. And that's pathological and non-pathological dissociation. So that means, you know, uh, gaps in memories, blockage of memory, depersonalization feelings, being highly absorbed into new materials and so on, that kind of thing. Now, what they say about that relationship is that it can be adjusted by these mediators and moderators. So genetics can mediate whether you have a strong reaction to trauma or not, you know, whether you become dissociated or not. A developmental level and the childhood environment, you know, at the time at which the trauma happened can also affect whether you become dissociated or not, according to this theory. And psychiatric vulnerability. So if you have a vulnerability to a psychiatric disorder, that can mediate the relationship between trauma and dissociation. In other words, you might, if you are vulnerable, you might be more likely to be dissociated if you're traumatized. Other mediators include pre-trauma and post-trauma life stress. In other words, if you have a stressful time before or after the trauma, that could lead to dissociation. Or if you don't have that stress, you might not get dissociated. That's a general idea of that mediator. And post-trauma social support. So if you go through a trauma and you're very well supported afterwards, that might change the relationship so that trauma does not lead to dissociation. So this is their general uh, model. What they don't say here, but they say elsewhere, is that dis that dissociation can lead to dissociative amnesia as a disorder or dissociative identity disorder and any of the other dissociative disorders too, including crossovers or comorbidities, they call them, with other disorders. So you can have, you know, dissociation comorbid with depression or dissociation comorbid with anxiety. This is their general th thinking of the trauma model. Now let's move on to some of the evidence that they present in Dallenberg and colleagues, that same paper. Well, first they make one hypothesis that the trauma model will predict a consistent positive relationship between trauma and dissociation. So we're just talking here about a correlation, not necessarily a cause. Of course, to establish a cause, you need at least a correlation, and then you need a few other things as well. So this is their table that they produced to test the idea of the correlation between trauma and dissociation. And these correlations here, the R number here, which ranges from zero to one, of course, on the right-hand side here, and these are all of the studies with non-clinical samples. So these are students, and adults who are not patients, they're not in any clinics, right? So they don't have a, a disorder. So if this theory is uh, generally true, you would expect to find a relationship in all samples that are big enough, even non-clinical samples. And um, you can see some of the researchers here are trauma and dissociation theorists. Some are critics like McNally here, but most of them are in fact trauma and dissociation theorists. Of course, those who disagree with the theory will not want to research it as much as those who agree with it. So anyway, so take any bias into account, but this is the data that they have. So the relationship between trauma and dissociation in this study, for example, is just 0 0.06, very small, not significant, and it ranges from that small amount to 0.42 here, which is larger. So these are small correlations. Now let's move on to clinical samples on the next part of the table over on the next page. Um, so in this table, this is clinical samples here, and you can just see that the 
correlations are just a little bit higher for some reason in these clinics. A lot of these clinics are um, where these authors were therapists themselves sometimes and perhaps in those clinics individuals get to learn about the theory of trauma and dissociation and you can see even in those clinics you know it ranges from non-significant results to a high of 0.63 in one of those studies so there is some evidence for a correlation between these variables, but it's still an open question as to well, how well these variables are measured. You can see that sometimes they're measured with trauma scales, such as the traumatic experiences questionnaire. Sometimes, most of the time, dissociation is measured with the dissociative experiences scale. And there is some question as to whether when you self-report these measures, whether your theory that you have in your mind about how you expect trauma and dissociation to work, whether that affects the way that you answer these surveys. So we were just talking about their first prediction, which was trauma correlates with dissociation. Now let's move on to perhaps the most important prediction they also made, um, which was prediction three, which I which is a, is a causal statement. So that's why I picked it out. So we'll look at that. So they say that the trauma model posits that the relationship between traumatic experiences and dissociation is, at least in part, causal. Accordingly, the trauma model predicts that dissociation will increase after known trauma for most individuals, and the dissociative symptoms will also wane spontaneously over time. And the evidence they write about is given mostly in Table 3, and they go over these um, seven research papers with, you know, less than 100 participants in each. And I haven't been able to read each one of them to um, critique them, but so I'll just present it as it is. So some of these uh, treatments that measured pre and post trauma events, and presumably they measured dissociation before and after too. Um, I would have to look into that a little bit more. So in the first treatment, one was using hypnotic treatment for combat-related PTSD. And um, what they're saying here is that dissociation went up after the trauma. I, I presume went down after treatment. Similarly with this um, DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, they saw the same results in people with bipolar. The Chad study down here was done with cognitive processing therapy, and they are claiming here that dissociation went up after trauma and then reduced with treatment. Similarly with the Ross study here, the type of treatment was stabilization and trauma treatment in the hospital program. In the Rothbaum study, they used PE, which is prolonged exposure, or EMDR, which is a type of exposure to memories as well, for recent rape victims, and they are claiming here that dissociation went up after the trauma and then dissipated after time. Same with the next study here by uh, Sachse, using dynamic trauma-focused treatment for bipolar and complex PTSD. Same pattern there. And the final study here, they're saying that in this clinic that used um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or writing tasks found the same pattern of dissociation going up after trauma and then die down after time or after treatment in people with PTSD and acute stress disorder. So that is the evidence that they present. I'm not going to critique it here. So that is me picking out just one part of Dallenberg. And Dallenberg, of course, is cited very often and is used by people in the court system to argue that we sh you should believe people who are saying that they have dissociative amnesia. And in fact, let's move on to a more recent article that in fact does talk about this more directly. They relate the findings in Dallenberg and the opinions of Dallenberg to the court system even more directly. Let's move on to the Brand et al. studies. Well, not studies, actually. They were reviews and basically arguments. Um, the argument being that 
people should know more about trauma-related dissociation. Expert witnesses should know. Juries should be informed um, so that dissociative memories are not dismissed in court. So that is basically the argument. And there's two parts to Brand's articles. This first part deals with addressing trauma-related dissociation as a forensic psychologist. So let me take a quote and and then I'll show you that in the second quote here, they relate their beliefs to what they recommend for expert witnesses. So the first quote is, although trauma-related dissociation, and they use TRD throughout the paper to mean trauma-related dissociation. So if you think about that, what they're saying is dissociation symptoms such as memory, feelings of depersonalization, and a tendency to be absorbed they're calling that dissociation trauma related so uh, as you can see there there's a little bit of an assumption of cause there but but let's let's move on so trauma related tr dissociation is a common reaction to trauma often associated with significant impairment and prognosis that necessitate extended treatment few assessors are knowledgeable about dissociation its assessment and methods for presenting information about it to courts in a way that is evidence-based and understandable, right? So they're talking, they're giving the same theory that we just talked about. It can be effective to point out to juries that this dissociative defense is used by most of us. Experts or attorneys can encourage jurors to notice if they themselves want to dismiss the validity of reports of well-corroborated trauma and compelling yet disturbing suffering related to trauma. Attorneys and expert witnesses need to help juries prepare for the upsetting de details of trauma they are going to hear in particularly disturbing cases. Attorneys can state that the details of the case are not easy to hear and share, that they are concerned that jurors may not be aware of their natural need to protect themselves, even by unwittingly denying the reality of the traumatic event or its impact, simply as a way of protecting themselves that they not even recognize. All right, so the argument here is tell jurors that they may have a reaction to the memory evidence that makes them want to reject the memory evidence and try and undermine that rejection. So um, try and tell them that you're naturally going to reject the memory evidence because it may be threatening to you in some way and to try and undo that bias, right? So you can see how this might be important in a case. And of course, in this lecture, I'm not being hypercritical, but I will be more critical in the next lecture. What I'm trying to do here is present their case as they say it. And let's move on to their second part of their pair of articles in psych Psychological Injury and the Law, where I have pulled out their definitions of dissociation um, that I'll read, and also their general point of their article. So let's go for the first quote that's from the abstract. Uh, which is really gives out the general point of their article, which is basically an argument to do with legal cases. So they say dissociative reactions to trauma, including dissociative disorders, are more common than most mental health professionals realize. Unfortunately, few professionals have training in the assessment of dissociation, and forensic experts may be unaware of research indicating the standard interpretations of well-regarded assessment instruments can result in the inaccurate determinations of symptom exaggeration in cases with dissociation. So what they're saying is some expert witnesses will be unsympathetic to, and some juries as well, will be unsympathetic to memory reports in court that are linked to dissociation or dissociative amnesia or the blockage of memory and then the recall of memory, right? So that is where they're coming from. They're saying that some forensic experts are not expert enough in dissociation and trauma. And interestingly, in this same article, they talk about dissociation. And I thought this might be a great opportunity for you guys to get a, 
a longer definition of what they think about dissociation right from the horse's mouth from individuals who um, believe in trauma dissociation theory and who serve in court cases as well. Now, they, these individuals may be on a different side of the debate than me, but let's just present it with a steel man approach where we present what they believe in their own words. Okay, so on the subject of dissociation, on page 299 of this article, they say, broadly recognized dissociative symptomology includes depersonalization, derealization, flashbacks, dissociative amnesia, identity alteration, identity confusion, and somatoform dissociation. So as you can see, that's a little bit broader definition than I've used before. Let's go on. Depersonalization includes experiences such as feeling unreal or emotionally numb or seeing oneself at a distance, as if in a movie. Seeing oneself at a distance is one of the most common forms of dissociation among trauma survivors, including individuals involved in civil litigation. Thus, assessors should ask about these experiences in all cases of reported exposure to trauma or threat of harm. So what they're saying is assessors should not forget to ask them of whether they feel um, depersonalized or separated from their self. Within the framework of standard questions about common psychiatric symptoms, the assessor should inquire whether the individual has ever had an out-of-body experience. Asked in this manner, the evaluee is not tipped off that this could be a trauma-related symptom, thus reducing the motivation among some individuals to exaggerate the presence or sever severity of the symptom. Depersonalization may occur during periods of acute stress as a byproduct of drug consumption and in disorders such as borderline personality disorder, anxiety disorders and psychotic disorders. Derealization occurs when an individual perceives the world around him or her as surreal or foreign. Okay, they go on to talk about dissociative amnesia. They say it is the inability to recall personal information that is not due to ordinary forgetfulness or a medical condition, such as dementia or head trauma. The marked difference in behavior and disruptions in sense of self present in persons with dissociative identity disorder are linked with identity alteration and confusion. Identity alteration refers to a person behaving in ways that are markedly variable in different states of self. And identity confusion refers to a person being confused about who one is due to experiencing variable ways of thinking, feeling and behaving in different states. They go on to say, somatoform dissociation involves disruption of bodily experiences and functions not attributable to a medical condition. Of note, experiences of absorption being so caught up in thoughts or in experiences that there is a disconnection or a dissociation between mind and environment, such as when one drives by the highway exit they need to take to get home, are not necessarily indicative of pathology in of themselves, but do tend to increase alongside dissociative and non-dissociative symptoms and are therefore useful to evaluate. So in other words, it's useful to ask people about uh, disconnection and absorption as well. So uh, there you have it. This is the way that they define dissociation and this is, these are the guidelines that they're giving. In, in other words, they're making the argument that expert witnesses in forensic settings should take on the view of trauma-related dissociation. In other words, um, believe in or at least know about the theory. So we just talked about how the peer-reviewed literature has trauma and dissociation in it. Those articles we just talked about are quite important type of articles that are cited a lot and used in legal cases, especially on the side of the prosecution. But let's move on to 
perhaps even more important literature, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, number five. As you know, this is used all around the world to diagnose mental disorders, but also it is sometimes used to guide the ICD-10 as well. So, so the question is, to what extent is trauma dissociation theory in the DSM? Well, I think they aim for the DSM to be fairly atheoretical, but they don't always succeed in doing so because there's always going to be a theory behind categorization. So here at the top right, you can see how they organize the different disorders um, that are related to trauma and dissociation. So the general heading is dissociative disorders on page 291. And that is divided up into several different categories. One is dissociative identity disorder. It used to be called multiple personality disorder. Another section is dissociative amnesia. And you can add dissociative fuge to that or not. And then you have bef below that, you have depersonalization, derealization disorder. So I assume that is symptoms of a depersonalization, perhaps without the dissociative amnesia or dissociative identity disorder. And then if you can't fit a given patient into a, a certain type, then you have other specified dissociative disorder that you can use, or you can use unspecified dissociative disorder, those, of those terms. So basically, you have DID, dissociative amnesia, and depersonalization categories, and then you have some extra categories as well. So what does it say in the DSM on dissociative disorders? Well, it starts out by saying, Dissociative disorders are characterized by a disruption of and or discontinuity in the normal integration of consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body, representation, motor control, and behavior. Dissociative symptoms can potentially disrupt every area of psychological functioning. This chapter includes dissociative identity disorder, dissociative amnesia, depersonalization, and other specified and unspecified dissociative disorder. And then it goes on to say some more. But let's skip past this to get to another section in the DSM on the next page. So let's first look in the DSM under the dissociative identity disorder. Just to illustrate a couple of things here, as you can see, it's not full of theory. It's more like it's more the case that it's the journal articles and the books that have the trauma and dissociation theory written out in more in full. And then the DSM tries to be a little bit atheoretical, but it, you do see the theory creeping in there. So I've, I've noticed a difference there. So the diagnostic criteria are for DID disruption of identity characterized by two or more distinct personality states, which may be described in some cultures as an experience of possession. Now, what I am thinking here is notice that they don't say that it's a delusion. It's, it's almost as if that they are saying it is actually a state. There, there are actually more than one state. Like there's some truth to there being more than one state or more than one personality. So they don't use the word delusion. And then they go on to say the disruption in identity involves marked discontinuity in sense of self and sense of agency accompanied by alterations in affect behavior and so on. Criteria B is that there is recurrent gaps in the recall of everyday events, right? So that might be a type of dissociative amnesia or repressed memories, but it might also be just individuals thinking back and, and thinking that, well, my memory is discontinuous, so therefore I think I've got some pathology, right? So recurrent gaps in important personal information and or traumatic events that are inconsistent with ordinary forgetting. So, the, so this is a little bit like dissociative amnesia. The idea that there's gaps in memory, but it's not due to ordinary forgetting and it's connected to trauma. Now, you notice how you have to really read between the lines here. They're not saying as implicitly here as previous articles we've looked at that trauma is the cause of DID or trauma is the cause of these gaps in memory but they're implying it here. And if you look, these sections are quite long. And if you read them all, you do find more and more clues in that they're hinting that this usually comes from severe stress. 
let's move on to the next part. And still under the heading of dissociative identity disorder in the DSM, let's pull out a couple of quotes here. So you can see here, they say that individuals with the disorder typically report multiple types of interpersonal maltreatment during childhood and adulthood. And then when they talk about the development of the disorder, they say that DID is associated with overwhelming experiences, traumatic events, and or abuse during occurring in childhood. So you can see there's some of the trauma and dissociation theory in the DSM, even though they try and keep away from it a little bit, in that they suggest that trauma is a cause and in the wording itself, instead of just calling it identity disorder, they actually choose to call it dissociative identity disorder. And the word dissociative, of course, comes from the theories of uh, Pierre Janet and uh, people. So there's actually theory embedded in the wording is, is what I'm trying to say. Now, moving on to dissociative amnesia, which is another subheading under dissociative disorders. So the definition here might sound familiar to you. So it's an inability to recall important autobiographical information, usually traumatic or stressful in nature. Well, that is inconsistent with ordinary forgetting. So it says dissociative amnesia most often consists of localized or selective amnesia for specific events or generalized amnesia for identity and life history, All right? So if I could decode that, localized and selective amnesia is similar to what we were talking about, repressed memories, and then generalized dissociative amnesia is more like uh, people have lost all of their, their identity and life history temporarily, uh, which, which does happen sometimes. Diagnostic criteria B, the symptoms cause clinical significant distress or impairment. As usual, you need that in diagnosis. C, the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, e.g. alcohol, drugs, or medication, or a neurological or other medical condition. For example, seizures, global amnesia, that's transient, head injury, that's an important one to exclude, and neurological conditions. And D, the disturbance is not better explained by dissociative identity disorder and other disorders. All right, so those are the criteria for dissociative amnesia. Now let's see if we can see if there's any evidence of trauma dissociation theory in the next page. Now turning over to page uh, 300, you can see that the risk and prognostic factors for dissociative amnesia are listed. So the first one is environmental where they say, single or repeated traumatic experiences, for example, war, childhood mistreatment, natural disaster, internment in concentration camps, genocide, are common antecedents. Dissociative amnesia is more likely to occur with one greater number of adverse childhood experiences, particular physical or sexual abuse, and two, interpersonal violence, and three, increased severity, frequency, and violence of the trauma. So you can see some of uh, trauma and dissociation theory that we talked about earlier is in the DSM. They just a little bit more careful with their causal statements, as you can see. And they also talk about other risks such as genetic, although they say there's no data on genetics or course modifiers such as uh, removal from traumatic circumstances can help and so on and so on. All right, so uh, there you have it from the DSM. As you can see, they are more careful than some of the peer-reviewed literature, and the peer-reviewed literature is more careful in its cautiousness than a book or website would be. So there's kind of a gradation of care of establishing cause. But as you can see, the trauma dissociation theory is suggested in the DSM, right? The, just by the categories themselves, the wording using dissociation, the emphasis on trauma, and uh, so on. And to a certain degree, trauma dissociation theory is also embedded into the ICD-11 as well. So as you know, the World Health Organization has a book called the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Health-Related Problems, and now it's on the 11th edition. So it is called the ICD-11 for short. And here you can see the section that they have 
similar, very similar to the DSM from the United States, but this is a worldwide organization of diseases. So you have the main heading, very similar, dissociative disorders, and you have a whole bunch of different disorders under there, such as dissociative amnesia, some slightly different categories than the DSM, but very similar. And you have dissociative identity disorder. Now, you can see the description here for dissociative amnesia. I've chosen this here. It says that dissociative am amnesia is characterized by an inability to recall important autobiographical memories, typical of recent traumatic and stressful events that is not consistent with ordinary forgetting. So you can see the influence and the importance of the DSM. It's very similar wording. And my assumption is that the DSM affects the way that the ICD is worded rather than the other way around, or they might, it might be a, a mutual kind of relationship. So let's move on to quickly look at the definition for dissociative identity disorder as well. Now looking at the ICD-11 for dissociative identity disorder, you can see very similar wording to what we've come across before. So DID is characterized by a disruption of identity in which there are two or more distinct personality states. Dissociative identities associated with marked discontinuities in the sense of self and agency. Now, you notice that they don't use the word delusion. They say that there are actually two or more distinct personality states. Each personality state includes its own pattern of experiencing, perceiving, conceiving, etc., and so on. So, as you can see, very similar to the DSM, the idea that these categories exist, these conditions exist, is embedded into the ICD, and partially the theory of trauma dissociation is also repeated in the ICD, although not as explicitly as in uh, journals and books. And beyond journal articles and the DSM, you find dissociative amnesia and dissociative identity disorder discussed a lot elsewhere too. So it's a kind of a cultural reinforcement of these beliefs about how trauma and dissociation work. For example, I just did a quick search right now and you can see lots of videos on YouTube about dissociative amnesia, all talked about in such a way as if it's a real condition and basically most of them discussing the theme of how trauma can cause dissociative amnesia. And if you do a quick search on Google, you find something similar where you find almost a million search results if you search for dissociative amnesia. And the first thing that it says is dissociative amnesia is a type of disorder involving the inability to recall important personal information that you would not typically be lost with ordinary forgetting. It is usually caused by trauma or stress. So there you can see trauma and dissociation theory right there on the top search result on Google. And you can see that you get similar reinforcement of these ideas on uh, the Cleveland Clinic, um, WebMD, um, the NHS has also cropped up, but it did not fit onto the screen and uh, so on. So I'll let you search for more on that. Well, I hope you enjoyed that lecture. It's certainly been a difficult lecture for me to put together because as I have been doing, I've been rereading some of these uh, sources and trying to reformulate my thoughts on them. And I'll give a little bit more of a critique in the next lecture. This lecture, of course, is aimed at Steelman in their position, laying out the theory as straight as I can. First of all, we talked about the history that came before modern day trauma and dissociation theorists. Now, I also established that this is probably the most important theory today because this is the way the theory that used to be about repressed memories and neurosis and so on, it's framed now with trauma and dissociation terminology. So that's why I'm spending so much time on it. This is a terminology that will come up in court, most likely in any case involving repressed memories. And if you're not aware of this new terminology, then it could quite easily pass you by. So we also talked about the theory, which was basically that trauma causes psychopathology. That's a big theory. And then within that big theory is that sometimes trauma creates dissociative symptoms. That can be a type of psychopathology, dissociative amnesia or dissociative identity disorder. And it's as those three sections, dissociative symptoms, dissociative amnesia, and disso dissociative identity disorder, that will be most likely connected to a problematic court case, right? So 
all other disorders in court with trauma causing depression, for example, or trauma causing anxiety is probably not going to involve memory issues. So it's only with these three sections with dissociative symptoms, amnesia or identity disorder, where you're going to have people testifying who believe that they have recalled something that they were not aware of for many years. So that's where you might find the need for memory experts to testify in court to help the jury figure out the case. Then we also talked about the most prominent articles recently by uh, Dallenberg and Bethany Brand and, and other researchers. Um, and now these are the ones that are most likely going to be talked about in court. Um, so uh, Dallenberg 2012 laid out the theory and tested the theory to their best ability. And I presented it to you in, in a Steelman version of, the, of, the, of what they found. And then the brand articles more recently take that same theory. I don't detect any change in theory but between 2012 and now. Same theory, but they talk more about more people should know about this theory as expert witnesses. You know, the jury should more, know more about this trauma dissociation theory so that they can believe witnesses when they recall dissociated memories and, and so on. I might talk about our response to the brand articles Harold Merkelbach, Henry Otgar and myself responded to those brand articles. I'll talk about that in the next lecture. Then I talked about how trauma and dissociation theory is somewhat in the DSM-5, just by the names of the categories, the categories themselves, the terminology, the implication of cause of trauma and so on. Very similar in the ICD-11 as well, the, the WHO's guidelines. And Oh, then I showed you right at the end that you find this reinforcement of trauma and dissociation theory everywhere, online, in long videos, on the internet, in internet searches and so on. So if someone were to be foolish enough to be a critic of trauma and dissociation theory, they have a lot of work ahead of them, right? And they have perhaps a, a frustrating career ahead of them, not particularly looking at myself, but there is some agreement between our position, the critic's position, and the trauma dissociation theorists, but you see what the differences are in the next lecture. Okay, thanks very much, and bye for now.